America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. At no other time in history have you had such a myriad of choices when it comes to the food that you eat. Just ahead, we'll clue you in on some growing food trends affecting you and your family. Organic foods are on the shopping list for many consumers. You'll meet some California farmers staking their future on organic farming and community-supported agriculture. Ever wonder about those gluten-free labels you see on products? We'll answer some questions about gluten in your diet and take you to Nebraska where one farmer is cashing in on gluten-free flour. Then, one Virginia school system takes an active approach to helping students eat healthier while benefiting local farmers. Let's find out about the food on your table just ahead on America's Artland. You having a good morning? Yeah. Yeah. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's Heartland, living close. Close to the land. We're going to spend a little time at a one of a kind dinner on a farm right here in Northern California. I'll tell you all about that in just a moment. You know, we've all known for a long time that eating the right foods can help improve your health. And there's a good deal of concern about childhood obesity but it's not always easy to make a direct connection to a specific diet or food group as being better for you. Organic, gluten-free? Many people, however, are making food decisions they consider to be beneficial, and some of those decisions start right here on the farm. Diners have shown up by the dozens for a unique event called Outstanding in the Field. Calling itself a restaurant without walls, the event sets up tables in farm fields and barns, serving up gourmet meals with local ingredients prepared by celebrated regional chefs. The aim is to reconnect diners to the land and the origins of their food by honoring local farmers and food artisans. You know, agriculture has the word culture in it, and uh, that's something that's, cult culture is powerful, and if people can access that and uh, understand it and meet the people that are doing that work, it's, it's substantial, it's, it's inspiring, and, and then it tastes good. So, it's good, <laughs> you can't beat that. To get out and actually cook outside and, and meet people and talk and, um, and just be out, you know, we're surrounded by fig orchards and stone fruit and the squash we're using today was grown here and it's cool, it's like, where'd you get that? Over there, <laughs> you know, isn't that fun? It's, it's really cool to do that, and the, the, the meat provider, his ranch is going to be here today, my fish provider, the ranch is going to be here today. It's, you know, there's a big connection. I can point to everyone that provided the food today, and that's fun. From May through November, Outstanding in the Field will host more than 80 such dinners in the U.S. and overseas. After a tour of the host farm, diners, culinary artisans, farmers and growers sit down to dinner, sharing the bounty on the long table. The dinner tonight is being hosted here at the Cape Organic Farm in Northern California. Organic farming has seen a double-digit growth in the past 10 years, and the number of organic farming operations in the U.S. has more than doubled since the early 1990s. For the farmers here, the mission is not only growing organic produce, it's getting those crops to consumers. It's a celebration of the tomato here at Cape Organic Farm in Northern California, complete with tomato tasting. Yeah, I didn't even realize there were going to be this many varieties, so I, yeah, I was kind of blown away. Some were just incredibly sweet and others were more tart or acidic and just, yeah, just full of, full, full of flavor. There's just a lot of nuances in the flavors and I've never noticed that before and it's a really great experience to be able to do that, spend the day out here and get to taste the complexities. The Farm's Tomato Festival is an annual event at the Cape Farm. It draws more than a thousand folks who show up for tomatoes, tasting, and tunes. Down the county, there was rubber bands, right 
The Cape Hayes Farm folks have good reason to celebrate their bright red tomatoes. Like the vines they grow on, the tomatoes are deeply intertwined with this farm family's success. How long will these produce fruit? So the harvest windows are like eight weeks, so they'll be kind of the first week is not very much, and then it slowly ramps up. Thaddeus Barsati is the chief farmer here. His parents, Kathleen Barsati and Martin Barnes, started this farm in 1976. They created a community-supported agriculture program in 1992 to sell produce. When the couple divorced, Kathy took ownership. The rumor is that my dad saw some thrown away heirloom tomatoes in the dumpster of a food service provider. And he said, wow, those are cool looking tomatoes and grabbed them and saved some seeds and we planted you know, a few rows of them. We grew 10 acres in 99 and my mom said, you know Thad, I think I could sell 20 acres of these tomatoes, but I just don't have the energy to do them, to plant them and harvest them and take care of them all. And I was at college and I said, you know mom, plant the 20 acres, I'll come back and help you that summer. That was actually the summer that uh, our mom passed away. She was sick, with, she had uh, breast cancer. So I took the farm over that summer with that 20 acres of tomatoes and we've been growing the program ever since. And so now we manage um, just under 100 acres of heirloom tomatoes. Every week she would do a recipe and, and uh, news about the farm. And in 2000, she kind of introduced Noah Thaddeus and I and said, you know, we still have the, that final farm news she wrote. Um, introducing us and saying, hey, your quality of the produce delivered right to your home is going to stay the same and, and they're going to continue it on. And I think that's been an important part, too, as she passed away, the, the four of us really bonded together and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to take this to the next level. We we're definitely left with the choice of do we want to keep the business going or not? And we unanimously decided, no, we're going to keep this going. Since taking over, Thaddeus, Noah, and Freeman have taken the farm to a size that they admit their mother could not have imagined. Besides selling produce wholesale to restaurants, today they operate the largest community-supported agriculture program, or CSA, in the country. Customers pay for deliveries of fresh produce directly to their home. They deliver in Northern and Southern California. We're delivering uh, throughout California, uh, most, most populated areas. And I think the key is, is to really support local and support organic. It's going to be seasonal. It's going to be as local as possible. The family works with other organic farmers across the state to make sure the CSA produce deliveries have various options. The brothers admit that becoming the largest CSA in the country with 500 employees and farm properties across the state was not in their parents' original plan. I really kind of wonder what, what she'd think. You know, she had some amazing ideas that, that we're, we're still doing the same business model that she developed in 1992. Um, we're, we're growing the same crops. We're, we have the same home delivery concept. We're just, you know, took her, her basic concept and, and just um, expanded the, the distribution and the size. And so really, I think if she looked at us today, she would see her fingerprints everywhere. They believe that despite their size, working together as a family and with other farms ensures that they're sticking to their parents' original mission. The family holds on to the belief that directly connecting with customers is key to their family's farming future. So our, our um, children are uh, growing up on the farm and um, we're wondering and how they're going to fit in. The reality is, is that we've taken a great thing our parents started and we're delivering it to more people. The real challenge is when our kids get it, you know, what are they going to do? So we're thinking a lot about that and watching the kids and realizing that they need to have good work, work ethic and understand how it works so when they get it that it's going to stick around for them to give to their kids. While California leads the nation in the number of organic farms in the U.S., several other states have ramped up organic production as well. They include Wisconsin, Washington State, New York, Maine, Minnesota, and Iowa. The demand for locally grown foods has sparked a dramatic growth in farmers markets. There were some 1,700 across the country in the early 1990s. By 2013, that number had grown to more than 8,000. Food trends are ever-changing. 
You'll see many more organic products today, and that's also true for products labeled gluten-free. We'll run down some of the details on gluten, but first, Sarah Gardner takes us to Nebraska, where gluten-free flour is a cash crop for one farm family. Getting a crop to market involves harvest time in the field for most farmers. That's true for Gerald Simonson and his son Brian. But for this crop, there is another step in the process. Well, how many different states do we have going out today? We got South Carolina, Wyoming, eight to Montana, California. This year we're on track to ship about 95,000 bushels. These 25 pound buckets contain food grade sorghum flour, a wheat flour substitute. Sorghum flour is used to make breads, cakes, and baked goods for those with celiac disease. The disease affects people whose digestive systems have difficulty handling the protein glutens found in wheat, barley, and rye. And this is what the flour looks like. It's a little, uh, got a little more of a yellow tint than, than say, white wheat flour, but uh, as far as texture and consistency, it's very close to white wheat flour. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, everybody knows whole wheat flour is healthier, better for you than white wheat, but most people prefer white wheat. And our customers are looking for, they miss white wheat flour. They want something as close to that as they can possibly get. Neither Gerald nor his wife Julie suffer from celiac disease, but a growing demand for the flour alternative has provided them with an opportunity to expand their sorghum operation. It's also generated positive feedback from their customers across the country. Every once in a while we'll get a letter back from somebody that says, I made pancakes for my husband and he hasn't had pancakes for seven years and he was thrilled. Or somebody who made a birthday cake for their daughter who was diagnosed or people will tell us, sometimes you get on phone calls and it's hard to get off of them because people will tell you that they're newly diagnosed. Well roughly 60% of our customer base is people that have either celiac sprue or another wheat intolerance. Now well, it looks like this is coming up pretty good. There's a few blank spots, but for the most part, it's good shape. Gerald and Brian are inspecting the fields on the 3,500 acres Gerald shares with his brother. To conserve water and reduce erosion, they use the no-till method of planting where old sorghum stalks are allowed to become compost for new crops. In this case, soybeans. This residue, compost, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, it's great for growing crops and your microbial activity, the insects, and all the natural things occur when you don't till the land. Their recently planted sorghum crop is just broken through. At maturity, the stalks will stand as tall as corn, and their tops will bristle with hundreds of seeds. It has a bushy head, and the seed is all completely exposed. There's no sheath on it or, or husk, like what you'd have with wheat or barley. Seeds from the stalks are what Gerald grinds into flour, first using a stone mill and then a sifter, separating the flour from the abrasive particles known as grits. But nothing is wasted. The grits are used as a high-protein livestock feed. Gerald is a fourth-generation Nebraska farmer, continuing a heritage his great-grandfather started when he planted Milo, an older name for sorghum. My granddad was uh, one of the first people to start growing Milo around here back in about 1929, and we've been growing it ever since. Whether the Simonson children continue the farming legacy is still uncertain. It's a question asked in many households across the heartland. For Brian, there's no definite answer yet. Well, there's a lot of other things that I'd like to do, but being out here is kind of hard to say no. You know, there's people who say the last thing they would do is encourage their son to stay on the farm and, and other people who want nothing more. And I think, uh, you know, that choice has got to be with Brian. Grown on millions of acres from Texas and Oklahoma through the Dakotas, sorghum's need for less water than some other crops makes it a popular choice for many farmers. Livestock feed and ethanol production provide possible markets but the Simonsons say the plant, as a food source, is important for the nation. Oh, I, I see big increases, you know, for the food sorghum industry in general. You know, we're not getting rich, but uh, the business is growing, and, uh, you know, it's holding its own.
Sorghum comes originally from Africa and in many regions was grown primarily as a source of syrup for sugar. But production really flourished when it was discovered that sorghum could grow in arid regions and be used as animal feed. You'll see the gluten-free label on everything from meats to beverages these days. So let's give you a little bit more information on gluten and how it may impact you. Hi, my name is Rose Mendonca, and I have a question about agriculture. I see a lot of gluten-free products in the supermarket these days. I'm not quite sure what gluten is. Where does it come from? And what kind of role does it play in the foods that I eat? Understanding gluten and discovering whether some foods have gluten requires a little homework. So let's give you the basics. Now there's nothing wrong with gluten by itself. It's simply a natural protein composite that you'll find in foods processed from wheat or other grains like barley or rye. Gluten helps to make your favorite bread chewy by giving texture and elasticity to the dough. You'll find gluten in breakfast cereals and baked goods. But gluten is also widely used as a thickener in foods, a flavor enhancer, even a protein supplement, which means you'll find gluten in everything from soups and gravies to salad dressings, dairy products, and even liquors. So why are you seeing gluten-free on product labels? It has to do with lots more consumer information coming your way these days from farmers and food processors, and it ties to the effect that gluten can have on some folks. A small segment of the population, estimated at one half to one percent, suffers from something called celiac disease. Gluten can trigger things like stomach disorders, joint pain, or headaches. And some other people have gluten intolerance not associated with the disease. So what about food choices without gluten? That includes foods made from corn, rice, soy, buckwheat, or sorghum and sorghum flour. But remember that even beverages can contain gluten. So be aware of that when you raise your glass. Well, my name is Kent Bradford. My work is involved in seed biology, seed production, and related to improving crop uh, varieties for production in agriculture. It is true that seeds are little miracles. That's, very, that's certainly true. This is a, uh, wild tomato species. In a very real sense, uh, seeds are critical to our future. That is a large fraction, not all of our agriculture, but a very large fraction of our agriculture depends upon being able to reproduce seeds annually. Wow, this is nice. Seeds that are used by farmers to grow crops have to be produced every year, uh, or at most uh, every other year, to provide good quality seed and efficient agriculture requires uh, uniform crops that uh, germinate quickly and establish quickly and grow rapidly. We need to be improving crops because the environment, the pests, the markets and so on are changing all the time. For example, the uh, size of watermelons has shrunk recently from large uh, watermelons that used to be the case to the small personal watermelon and that's all done by developing new varieties that uh, appeal to consumers. We have so many new tools now that we didn't have in, in previous years. In the last 20 years, certainly, uh, our ability to understand the basis of traits that we want has improved enormously. It's as if uh, it's a uh, GPS for breeders. I think if uh, someone is looking for a career in plant science, this area of uh, plant breeding and seeds is a great place to be. It's, it's really uh, the intersection between the technology and the practical aspect. Uh, it's in a way, a way to think about seeds in agriculture these days is, in a sense, they're the microchip. They're the, they're the heart. You plant a seed and that carries all of the, the traits, all the effort that the breeders have put together. The more that we can do that, the less we have to then add later, the less fertilizer we have to add later, the less pesticide we have to use to control diseases. The ability to now feed six and a half billion people is largely due to plant breeding. Clearly, as we go toward nine billion people, in the next 30 years, uh, we're going to need to double food production again, and we simply can't do that without improved varieties.
You know, we mentioned childhood obesity at the start of the show. Many communities have kicked off programs that aim to help youngsters eat healthier. That includes better information about food choices and menu changes for things like school lunches. Let's take you to Virginia, where one school district has combined that effort with a program to benefit local farmers. The kitchen is bustling this early morning at Smithland Elementary School in Harrisonburg, Virginia. While the lunch ladies chop, mix, and bake, a visitor shows up at the kitchen. You having a good morning? Yeah. yeah. Local farmer Marlon Showalter drops by the kitchen with bins of bib lettuce ready for chopping. Showalter sells about 300 cases of hydroponic greenhouse grown lettuce to area schools each week. The stuff that you just brought in today, when was that picked? Well, actually, this was harvested this morning. Uh, really? Yeah, it was. The lettuce gets turned into salad and is among the locally grown lunch choices that the staff and students here are proud of. We've always had the goal to make our meals healthier. So for the past several years, we've done a lot of things like increasing fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains, lowering fat, eliminating fried foods, things like that. So the next logical step for us was to think about trying to get an even fresher product to students when we can. The school effort is part of a statewide initiative in Virginia to help schools buy more lunch ingredients regionally. These are Virginia apples here? They are, yes. And Virginia apples are available to Virginia schools through most of the school year. Are they they? hold very well in cold storage, so. Is this Marlin's yeah. lettuce right here? That is some of Marlin's and some from another farmer who grows romaine lettuce. So we've okay. got a mix there of bib and romaine, both okay. grown locally and they are grown in greenhouses. This reminds me of uh, the lunch line <laughs> when I was, they served up everything in they, an ice cream you know, scooper. You know, these are like a lunch lady's favorite yes, weapon. Yes, it is portion control, <laughs> and this is a good thing, especially right, in our right. country where we eat too much. So I know we, we, we sort of have that bad connotation of <laughs> Slap it on. lunch but this lady is, with the- This is not that, That right? is not, not that, all. no. Okay. This, this gives us the correct portion for students. These are homemade yeast rolls, and we're using a blend of 50-50. It's a 50-50 blend of whole wheat flour, which is milled, it's local wheat, milled locally, as well as uh, a bread flour that we get through USDA commodities. So it, the rolls are half local. I see a lot of local products here today, yes. and obviously that's not necessarily the case all the time, right? It just it, can't be, right? It can't be, that's right, that's right. We are serving about 3,500 meals a day in our division. So when we think about the volume of food that we use, it would be difficult to get all of it local and still be able to give kids lunch. The biggest challenge to any locally grown effort is the weather. Midwinter in Virginia means little is growing outside. The school district is hoping to purchase 10% of their lunch ingredients locally. Right now it's about 5%. Turning to non-weather dependent choices is also an option. Not too far away in the small town of Charlottesville, another food producer is seeing positive impact from school's efforts to buy locally. The historic Wade's Mill uses stone grinders to produce flour. The school purchases wheat for bread products from Wade's Mill. It does benefit the bottom line and then we're pleased to see it because uh, the schools are not only using local produce products, uh, they're teaching the kids, the children more about nutritional value of what they're eating and where it comes from, who's producing it. But, uh, uh, what it all means to the local economy. Improving school lunches has gotten national attention as childhood obesity continues to grow in the U.S. What was your favorite thing on your tray? The spaghetti? Good, okay. Chris Shipman from Standard Produce in Charlottesville, Virginia, says incorporating regionally grown into established distribution channels is possible. So we have to supplement uh, what we do have locally with what we can uh, pull out of the California area, uh, the Florida area. And then as, as spring starts, we start moving up the East Coast. So the things that we are buying are, are getting closer and closer uh, to Virginia until we move into around June 1st is when we'll really start into a lot of Virginia product. Back in the lunchroom, Andrea Early says buying fresh produce is just one piece of a larger puzzle to get kids to eat healthier. Food manufacturers have really done a good job of stepping up to the plate to reduce sodium, reduce fat, 
um, make those foods still taste good and things that kids like, but make them a little bit healthier versions. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a great afternoon. Another advantage to buying locally grown, the kids not only get to eat the food, they get to meet the farmer who grows it. So do you all have any questions? Like the Farmers in the classroom and their products in the cafeteria, a good lesson for kids who may never plant seeds or till the soil, but will have a lifelong reliance on those who do. Awesome! We've talked a lot about food and food choices. Just a reminder that we have lots of great recipes on our website, along with video from this and all of our shows. Log on to americasheartland.org. And of course, there's lots going on in the social media arena. You'll find us there as well. We'll see you next time right here on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand In America's heartland, living close, close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe.